What is up, everybody? Jim and I are once again joined by the Ryan McIntyre for one of our fantastic, fun, and factual cartridge talks. We're going to talk today about the 308. Now, we talked a little bit about the 308 ish when we did our NATO talk. Uh, so if you want some additional information on this cartridge, you can peek back at that one. Some of this might be a little bit redundant, but it just warrants repeating because this is an iconic cartridge. This is a good one. Yeah. Mark, I'm surprised. So you're kind of, you, you know, you run the show around here now and we had a 223 episode pretty recently. We actually gave that a full length and 308 has been sort of doomed into the existence of just a 10 minute talk. I don't really know how that happened. In fact, I, Why, uh, I actually thought we were doing get a, no respect. I, I thought I know, and it should. As much as we jest around here and we talk about like, oh, three hundred eight is that the one that you load from the front? You know, mm-hmm. uh, it's a good one, Ryan. What's going? What's going on with this thing? It's not new. Nope, it's old. Nineteen fifty two. It's still around. Yeah, nineteen fifty two is when it hatched on the commercial scene. Um, so it, military cartridge and a commercial cartridge uh, developed. You know, to kind of replace the 30 out six as a more portable, as capable package, smaller, mm-hmm. lighter weight, um, carry more ammo, put them in lighter, more nimble guns, um, and resounding success on the commercial side as, yeah. a, as a hunting cartridge. Well, one thing that I found curious when I was trying to do my research, it was actually a commercial cartridge before it was adopted by the military, just by a couple years, it seems, at least the way it looks to me. Yeah, the development of the T-65 cartridge was, I think that started in the 40s, okay. like 1946, 47, mm-hmm. which then eventually kind of morphed itself into the 308 Winchester. So there's like a, a 300 Savage-ish kind of thing going on. Right, right. And then here we have 308. I was thinking about that. We should, I'd like to do like a 300 Savage versus 308. Mm. I wonder what that looks like. Pretty close. Interesting. Pretty close. Yeah, but when you say 300 Savage, it sounds way more, you know... Uh, unique, maybe a bit. Uh, well, it does because it, it is. Bit, well, and it, it is. Never but got it, the, no, uh, it, unique's the wrong word. It sounds a bit more snoozy. Like, like what are you trying to pronounce it? Out of a, it savage. You'd be shooting it brawl, maybe. You'd be French. shooting it out of like a Ruger number one or something. Whereas a three hundred eight is like, wow, that's a utility cartridge. You shoot that out of a hunting rifle or something. But I think that's just how it's been framed for so long. Well, yeah, I'm just saying. I'm trying to acknowledge the framing. Are we fighting? Might be. Is this my we're fault? Only, <laughs> we're only three minutes in. Um, what's the deal Look, with? You've been gone a long time. Okay, I know, I know. What's the deal with? Like, it's funny how in the commercial market the 308 has. Okay, I'm, I'm going to s- say some things based solely on my perception. When you see the 308, or you know the 762 NATO used in military use, it seems as though it has more of almost like this uh, specialty type role. Where it's in, you know, some of the more DMR designated marksman type rifles. It's not the it's the thirty cal isn't what the average guy just lugs around all the time. Oh, you know, all of them. Whereas back in the day, with the thirty odd six, basically everybody had a thirty cal, right? Um, now, in referring to the uh, to the thirty odd six, um, and now so it was almost like they went to this three hundred eight. Oh yeah, it might replace the thirty odd six, but it's almost as though they didn't go. Full tilt. They didn't go full tilt enough because yeah. then they had to go yet even further yet to the five five six, the yeah. two twenty three, and then they sort of rested at all right. We've we've swung the pendulum far enough to the other side of the spectrum, mm-hmm. and then the seven six two just kind of in terms of the military's use seemed mm-hmm. to fall in this weird middle ground, and it's still kind of there, but on the commercial side, very prolific. Yeah, it's everywhere. Yeah, so like medium machine guns, so think M sixty, M sixty three, M two forty. Um, <clears throat> chambered in, in that, and then like specialty rifles like the M110, SR25, yeah. um, M14, um, and then now the SCAR-17 and, and some of the newer HK M4 type rifles chambered in 308. <clears throat> so yeah, they do kind of fill a specialized role as more that, as you stated, like DMR type rig. Um, yeah. There's a little bit more horsepower there, a lot of bit more weight, a lot of bit more recoil than the 223. So it, it does kind of occupy a different space. Was yeah. it it, is that somehow, or is that somehow related? Is that like a timing issue in a way? Like, was it slated to be that, like, you know, like, like everyday walk, not everyday, but like, you know, your the infantry, infantry guy, like, yeah. Yeah. and then all of a sudden, like, timing wise, like, yeah, wait, we got the five, five, six. I think, I think That's so. Yeah, be a better option. I'd, I'd love somebody who's really up on on like military arms history to to look at like when 
the M1 kind of transition to the M14, mm-hmm. and then the strange period of time between M14 and M16. And it, did the M16 displace it? And yeah. I think it did, right? Mm-hmm. That makes sense. I mean, it, I mean it guys aren't carrying around M14s right now. Right. I mean, very, very few. often. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm, I think that's what it was. I think, like, the M16 came on scene and there was this massive adoption to it. And, you know, that took off. And the M14 just kind of scraggled along. The sniper role picked up the 308, though. Mm-hmm. Um, similar or same time frame, Vietnam conflict. And... And then carried on, um, you know, and, and it still occupies that space pretty darn well. Um, it's been, you know, pushed around by a couple of other cartridges and, and it'll probably still be there for a little while. Yeah. But well, we're here to talk. Sorry, I didn't mean to bring us in the military thing because we're here to talk about the 308. Not yeah. The 762 by uh, 51. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Uh, so the 308, though, if you want to know a cartridge that everybody has done everything imaginable with even would you say even more so than the ot6 i mean it seems like uh, from a commercial standpoint well let's, yeah. let's look at it real quick uh 243 and these are just the really popular ones 243 260 708 308 of course uh 338 federal 358 winchester then the mm-hmm. rimmed version 356 winchester which is like a rimmed version um right. and the 307 winchester right so that's just things that have been derivatives off of it. But like seven direct, and then, and then I'm even thinking eight. Yep, I'm even thinking just within the 308 bubble itself, though, what people have done with with the 308. Oh yeah, you know what I mean. Just the different bullets they've stuffed yep. in it, the ways they've loaded it, mm-hmm. um, from you know like probably pretty high velocity stuff down to subsonic stuff mm-hmm. at times. I mean, people shoot an ELR mm-hmm. to some extents, long range. Hunting. Oh, and anything. The, well, like even speaking to like the competitive shooter, there are divisions and classes structured solely around that cartridge. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Solely. So, like F class and, and PRS, um, those guys shoot 308. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. it works really good. Um, as a hunting cartridge, of course, it's extremely capable and, and very popular. I, I'd say maybe waning a little bit um, compared to some of these newer modern cartridges like the 6.5 Creedmoor we have pictured next to it or shown next to it. It's not a picture. It's real. It's here. Um, <laughs> so, These aren't virtual cartridges. No, no, they're real. It's real stuff. Uh, no, I mean, it's a spectacular round. And, and speaking to the versatility of, of grain weight and, and bullet offerings, I mean, anything within the 30 caliber palette can go in there. You know, performance results may vary. And has. Yeah. Uh, I mean. At some point. Yeah. I mean, I shoot a 308 quite often. It's one of my favorite hunting rifles. I shoot a 130 grain projectile out of it. Mm-hmm. Um, I've shot up to 175 grain projectiles out of them. Actually, we shoot 178s here um, when we're doing accuracy testing with with 308. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a super versatile cartridge. Super versatile. And I like, mean, like Jim was saying, every rifle manufacturer mm-hmm. makes 308. Every ammo, ammo, ammo manufacturer makes, I mean, just a variety of 308 yep. with any bullet that you want for any application that you want. Mm-hmm. I mean, any shooting discipline like you're talking about, Ryan, I mean, really, whatever you want. If you're looking for yeah. it, you can get it in the 308. You, you want to get into reloading? Why not do the 308 to actually just get used to the process, practice, yep. learn, because there's just infinite amounts of information out there from yep. everybody who's reloaded 308s before. I mean, it's just like... The most explored territory in ammo is probably the 308, and very forgiving too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, well, and I, then sorry, I'm gonna interject here, Ryan. My apologies. I'm I'm pretty jacked up about the 308, but if you are into reloading or things like that, and you mentioned all those other cartridges, Ryan, mm-hmm. you can re- if you have a bunch of 308 brass, you, you can resize it, mm-hmm. and make some something different. Yes. Um, what I like about the cartridge is like the cartridge itself, the shape, the size lends itself useful in every like conventional platform of firearm that we have. So from bolt action, slide action, single shot, uh, semi-automatic, and whether that's like a Browning BAR or, a, a, you know, a AR-10 or something like that that can do it. Even lever guns, there's a couple of them out there. I think, Jim, you might, you might even have a 308. Oh, 
Yes, you do. You know, I always forget that my lever gun is a three hundred eight. <laughs> you were mad about it at first. I remember you. You're like ah, three hundred eight. I was. I really wanted to get the seven millimeter yeah. 08, and yeah. you convinced me to get a regular three hundred eight. I'm yeah. not mad about it, but now, um, but I forgot. Yes, I do indeed. My hunting rifle is a three hundred eight. Yep, and uh, it, it's a super utilitarian, super slick round, and I think its dimensions, its shape. Um, that's what, what lends its popularity or boosts its popularity is the ability for it to be chambered in pretty much every mm-hmm. conventional style of arm we have. It's I a think, short action. I think maybe some of the waning popularity could be for reasons like I just experienced right now. I forgot that I shoot a three oh. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, oh, that I literally, thing. literally like not even that old of a gun and I've right. hunted with it before. I mean, and I forgot it was a three oh. Oh yeah. I think that's with the 308. Like you, you look at maybe a lot of the numbers. Like not not super sexy. Not like you know you look at it's not uh, blowing the doors off. You know maybe some of these other more modern cartridges. Does it need to? Well, okay, question exactly. Mm-hmm. Does it need to? And then Ryan, you use the word. I mean, you took it right out of my mouth. The utility. Yeah. Like you look at its practical use mm-hmm. for an amazing array of applications mm-hmm. and its effectiveness on game out to moderate ranges it's really just going to do everything you need the more i shoot it the more i ask why don't we all just shoot 308 that's something that i've said before it, yeah i mean i think i've made the parallel before but if you're into cars it's the ls yeah the motor it's the chevy ls motor yeah okay you can tune it up you can just leave it be it's in trucks it's in very very fast sports cars it's in cars that went to le mans i mean it's you can do anything. Yes. And everybody's done everything with it. Yep. So if you want to learn something, you know, I mean, it's just go out and do it with a 308. Yep. yep. One of the reasons that I select a 308 as one of my primary hunting cartridges is one, it keeps me honest because I don't have these big, crazy numbers. Um, you know, and two, that, that versatility, like in the, in the bullet palette. So I shoot a 130 grain bullet at 3150 out of it and I have a trajectory not dissimilar to like a 270 or a 65 Creedmoor. So when I'm shooting like Western game, you mm-hmm. know, up to mule deer, um, pretty darn flat, bucks win pretty good, uh, really easy to get behind and shoot. Um, and then if I decided that I was going to go to Alaska and I was going to hunt caribou and I was going to be in, you know, big bear country, I loaded up with like a 180 grain projectile or 175 grain projectile, something real tough. And I really wouldn't be giving up a heck of a lot. I'd still have this super fly weight, portable, shootable rifle in a capable cartridge. And I can Mm. go to very large game on down with it and feel totally comfortable. I'm not necessarily advocating this because I know if I was in brown bear country and maybe it's just like a mental thing, I'm going in with a little bit more gas. Mm -hmm. But I know a person who lives in Alaska, they were hunting on Kodiak. His wife had a brown bear tag and she shot a giant brown bear with a 308. Yep. Killed it dead. Yeah. I mean, would it be the first choice? Probably no, I not. mean, it, I feel like you can have a 338 Win Mag or you can have a 308. I'd probably jump on the 338 right. Win Mag, but I wouldn't necessarily be up a creek without a paddle. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You mentioned something, you you know, loading it up and loading it down. I mean, that's something you can really do with this cartridge, too. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can you can gas it up a little bit or mm-hmm. you can step it down. I know, like, this, um, one of those we have here is the, you know, the Federal Gold Medal Match, which actually I used that, Ryan, in your 308, that Kimber, Montana, when I went to uh, hunt uh, Sika Blacktails yep. in the Alpine and, you know, shot a shot a blacktail with it. It did great. I mean, that stuff just hammered out of that yep. gun. Did I mean, you, it was just shooting so good. Did I think you buy it, this in 1987? I, I don't know. When's that from? The box looks like it's from that era. It might be a little bit antiquated. They might, but, they, mean, might not, they might wrong. not make There's the, nothing wrong it came with that. Out of my, it came of, out of my basement today. I kind of like it. I had it from that. Still works. Um, was yeah, that from, exactly. Still was works. that from that hunt? I think that's what it's from. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so this is my ammo? Might be. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't had... Uh, well, I haven't why, had why, why don't we address the cup in the room, Ryan? Oh, Mark, you left this at my house. Squatter's right. We have a symbiotic uh, yeah. Yeah, you relationship know what, there. Mark, you know what? Honestly, with you, it's all the kick, heard the fart. Let's move on. Yep. So back to I've the never 308. heard that before. It sounds <laughs> disgusting, but um, you made me lose my train of thought. Oh, <laughs> oh! Speaking of loading up, loading it down. Yeah, like you got uh, Hornady though. Yep. They, they make those reduced recoil loads for the it. the lights. Yeah, the the yeah yeah. Fantastic loading. If you have a smaller statured or newer shooter, you I mean you're still surpassing what like a thirty thirty Winchester would have in terms of like mm-hmm. ballistic performance. Wow. 
Um, and it, it's, it's not dissimilar in recoil in an appropriately weighted rifle. And so I think it's super, super useful there. Um, and actually, I mean, that, that's another thing I love about the cartridge is like, if you do have a new shooter that you do want to hunt big game with and you want to be, you know, effective and ethical with it, it's not a cartridge that's going to bowl that shooter over necessarily like a 300 Win Mag would or something like right. that. Yeah. Um, it's, it's pretty darn mild mannered in the right platform. And if you tweak it a little bit, it's even, it's even more so. Like that, that Kimber I have weighs six pounds, two ounces with three cartridges in the magazine mm-hmm. and a scope on it. Um, it has a muzzle brake on it. And with the brake on there, it's a joy to shoot. It's a, it's a hoot. Um, and you can shoot full house loads in it and it's not going to, it's not going to bust your collarbones. Um, so, I mean, really quite a useful cartridge in, in that sense as well. And, and you're really not giving up a heck of a lot ballistically. I mean, it'll kill a bison. It'll kill there black you go. Tail. Yeah, Aaron mm. in the office. Yep. yep. Somebody, uh, well, sometimes in these cartridge talks, Ryan, we've talked about some of the extremes that you can take a cartridge yeah. to. What, uh, from what you've seen snooping around out there or in your own experimentation, what have you seen as some of the extremes in terms of bullet weight, Yep. tiny bullets, big bullets, Yep. and also uh, velocities and stuff like that of this thing? 110 VMAX is north of 3,200 feet per second, like quite a bit north. Um, which is fast, which is flat, pretty aerodynamically challenged projectile, but sure for a, a decent distance, it's like a laser beam trajectory. Um, and then on the high side, uh, 220, 240 grain serum match Kings going at, you know, subsonic levels, um, or maybe just that a little bit over. Fun. Yeah. I mean, so like a 240 SMK, which is, I don't even know if serum makes that projectile anymore. I've still got like seven or eight of them left. Um, <clears throat> that bullet is like this long it's huge <laughs> it fills up so much of the case um and when you load it with the right powder and if you're if you're targeting subsonic velocities it's a super easy one to do it and there's probably better projectiles out there for doing that now um you know that that will actually like initiate expansion on impact if you were going to hunt with subs um that'll that'll do just as well but yeah i mean a- anything in that 30 caliber pallet again you, you can mm. stuff into that case and utilize it they even have these little bullets made for like 32 ACP that you can load in them. Um, my first spear reloading manual, I want to say they were like an 80 grain projectile, like a lead round nose with a semi jacket on it. And they had low data for 308 for those. So, wow. yeah. Um, That's bizarre. Yeah. What cool. A, what but a, like weird. <laughs> what about if you're like, okay, I, I got a 308 and when you maybe with like some of the, you know, I'd say like medium ish size bullets, you know, maybe like the, you know, like that's a 168. You see kind of stuff, I'd say, in that, you know, bracket. Yeah. What can you take that bullet and gas it up to, like, from a hand-loading perspective, you know, velocity-wise? Probably 2,800. Okay. I mean, you could maybe go more depending on the case used. That's all right. Yeah. I mean, it occupies, like, a projectile weight like that most loads out of the box between 2650 and 2750 mm-hmm. somewhere in there and you could certainly go up a little bit higher and undoubtedly you could go higher if you have a strong enough case and you're you know diligent with your reloading practices and and you've got a barrel length that's long enough i'm, I'm certain you can squeak out more <clears throat> and then if you look at like some of hornady's super performance loads where they're putting like a 165 or a 150 in there you know they're they're in 30 out six territory like well within 30 out six territory on the smaller case hmm. Yeah. So even the even the 300 Savage, which is a smaller case yet, very similar but smaller, that's getting, you know, north of 2,900 feet per second with a 150 in the super performance load. So the 308 is just going to increase that up even higher. I mean, it's a lot of performance. It is. It's a ton. I'm And like I said, if you're matching the correct bullet um, and it's at an appropriate velocity, you don't lose a whole heck of a lot at all. Um, and that's why I'm very comfortable hunting with it. Mm. Yeah. At the longer ranges? I'm assuming you just kind of lose with a cup, probably multitude of things, but BC would be like a big contributing factor when, oh, yeah. when you see like the six five Creed start to beat it out yep. at those longer distances. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, you're you're looking at a far 
more aerodynamic projectile mm. and generally at a little bit higher velocity. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's doubling down on it. What's the deal at long range? Everybody talks about how the 308 basically falls off a cliff. At, at 800, at like yeah, a, at, it just, yeah. It just hits a wall and then falls down. Yeah, yeah. so there, it's there's a force field. It's like watching yep. Star Wars or something. You know, that's, shields up. Uh, that's what happens. Okay, got it. So I wanted to make <laughs> sure. But I mean, the, th- the funny thing is, is everybody talks about this. Look at us. We've gone over 20 minutes. That's usually oh, the dead mark, but we're talking about the 308. So yeah. we're going to carry on. Um, cause Mark forgot to give it its, it's, you know, it's due, uh, time. We didn't make it a full length. Anyway, people are talking about long range shooting with a 308. Yeah. So many people, many of whom don't actually shoot 308 are like, ah, it falls off a cliff. But then there's people who shoot further than a thousand yards with 308 mm-hmm. all the time. Mm-hmm. Who's right? Ryan, which one? Uh, are they lying that they've shot further than a thousand yards with a 308? No. I don't think so at all. I'm, it, I, they're not. If, if you pair <laughs> if you pair it with the right bullet and you've got the right charge behind it, and the gun is set up to do it, I mean F F class is a thousand yards. Yeah. Um, they shoot tiny little bug holes there all the time. I mean, wind is a huge factor. Mm-hmm. Everything is a huge factor when you're shooting at that distance with just yeah. about any cartridge anyway. Um, and beyond that, no. I, I as long as you're paired with the correct bullet and it has a high enough BC and you, you do have the velocity at the right spot, it's certainly capable. Is it as flat as a six five Creedmoor? Well, no, no, it's not supposed to be either. It seems like it seems like when you're tra- when it's traveling supersonic, mm-hmm. relatively you know uh, forgiving cartridge, relatively predictable, yeah. and then it's that transonic time, that, yeah. which is what happens around the eight hundred to a thousand yard arena, if you will. That's mm-hmm. where people tend to probably have the most issues with it. But even still, I've heard from long range shooters that once you go beyond the transonic point. It actually becomes a little bit more predictable again. Sure, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that, so tur- that's, that turbulent period right. between you know super trans and sub. Mm-hmm. Yeah, in trans. But yeah, that's where it would seem like you know shooting beyond a thousand. I mean, it's kind of like you just gotta get through that. I it's, mean, it's one of the things that you just have to deal with when shooting this. But so many people, again, because this is a cartridge that so many people have shot so many times in so many different applications and ways and manners and distances. There's ways to figure this sort of thing. Yeah. Again, it, it's cartridge two. If you're looking to get into reloading or long range shooting, and Scott has said it on this podcast before, get a 308 because you learn all the bad habits or well, you identify the bad habits. You can tune them out mm-hmm. because the cartridge is a little bit taller in the recoil side of things. Um, and, and you can't make as many mistakes because there isn't so much ballistic compensation going on, such as super high BC projectiles at pretty, you know, speedy velocities. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, to your point, the smattering of low data out there. I mean, you'll get tired of scrolling through dozens and dozens of page, pages of published load data. Same thing with, I mean, I can only imagine mechanical reliability in various firearms, yep. too. I mean, if I go on to some forum or I go into a gun store or if I go into wherever and there's other people who are into firearms and they have more experience than I do, and I say, I've got a 308, it's not feeding. Or I've got a 308. It's I'm having trouble here. Mm. I, I'm a hundred times more likely to get an answer that's actually helpful and potentially just going to set me right on the right path immediately than I am if I walk in and I say I've got a six R Dasher Rudolph Santa Snow. I mean, like mm. whatever. I mean, that is a fast cartridge. So. Yeah, but if I walk in and say I've got something like that, people are going to just. It's a, well, good luck, kid. Yeah. You know, I don't know. It has a lot of history behind it from the can we make it work standpoint, you know? So like the LS, oh, it's doing this? Well, then it's that. And then that's probably happened before. Somebody's probably figured out how to tune it out and make it operational. Someday the old bitch cat's going to be just like that. that. Everybody's going to have one. There's going to be a BC in every gun safe. Speaking <laughs> We, Speaking of BCs and cartridges and cartridge, cartridge designs and kind of like what we've talked about with this, you can turn it into so many different things. Yeah. And maybe even one of the things that you mentioned is one of those things. We've gone long. I've given up on time. This is... Uh, it is what it is. You went like, an hour with Paul Neese on a 10-minute talk. Exactly. Once, so. There's no rules. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we live in anarchy. Uh, w- like, what if you'd like neck that down, thing down to six millimeter? 243. That's just all that is? That's oh, it? yeah, that is what that is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's done. Done oh. and done. Yep. <laughs> the Playing two, this the two game. Four, the 243 
isn't as sexy anymore because we don't call it six millimeter though. Isn't it's that true. wild? It yeah. is. It's when f- metrics fell on their face, everybody's like two forty three, good old American standby. Yeah. yeah. And then when now it's like two forty three. Oh yeah. my gosh! Yeah. Can you believe it? What a gosh! Why don't you yeah, go to the driving been range down from four to four generations? Yeah. Look at my new six millimeter with almost identical case <laughs> capacity and performances. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Hats uh, off to you. Uh, and find me a, a, a bad cartridge based on the case. And you'll just hear silence in the room. You this won't. neck down to Seven, 22. 7 mm 8 What is it? 22 Cheetah. Is it cool? Oh. It's, yeah, like a 22 250. Okay. Yeah. I'll Barrel, just call it Cheetah. Another benefit of the 308. I, every time we do a cartridge talk, and we've said it before, I talk myself into that cartridge. Right. N- n- not every time. I don't have to talk myself into this one because I have one, You Mark. do own one. I've just borrowed Ryan's. Uh, but uh, it's just a <laughs> it's just a damn fine do-all. It is. Good barrel. Oh, barrel life. That's what I was going to mention. All day. Yeah. The, my first range certification gun was a 308. It was a Savage Model 10 that predates my employment at Vortex by a good number of years. Um, when Paul Neese handed it to me from the vault, it like had, I mean, it looked, it was rough, right? It had been to umpteen demos, shows, and shoots. I think it did a couple of Vortex Extremes. Oh, yeah. Um, and I said, does it shoot? He's, he just kind of laughed. And, and he's like, I don't know. There's some ammo back in the vault. Go get it. And um, I have no idea how many rounds I put through that gun. Which one was that? It was a Savage Model 10. Oh, Like yeah. a, a heavy barrel target gun. We had like three of those. Yeah. Um, and I mean- piles and piles and piles of brass through that thing during years of shooting it. And uh, I finally cleaned it because I thought I had to. (laughs) And whatever I did when I cleaned it, it never came back to life. Ever. That's why you can't Uh, clean your guns, Don't clean your guns. I know. I never have. So the the, the barrel life is is pretty darn good, right? It's not a super fast cartridge. It's not chewing up the throat and it's it's not burning the thing down. Um, so it's going to be a lot more forgiving. You're probably going to get a lot more rounds out of it. And I mean, it, it works really good for that. I think that's why like the two forties chambered in 308 and the M60 was chambered in 308. I mean, you can get a lot of rounds on the barrel before you have mm-hmm. to change it out. Well, I think bolt guns in 308 suppress really nice too. Yeah. You know what else? I mean, when we start talking about custom rigs, what bolt face are you going with? Nobody gives you the inch designation. They go, oh, it's 308 bolt face. Yeah. Like it's, oh, c- cool. So then you can load all these different cartridges in there that can do all these great things. 308 bolt face. Like that's the designator. 308. <clears throat> yeah. That's an interesting. It, uh, it's at a crazy standard. And it's very hard to deviate from. Like you really have to ask yourself why. Like wh- why do I need more or less than this? Right. Because yeah. it just works. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Well, we didn't make 20 minutes on the first 20 minutes. We're going to be. If we wrap this thing up, sub 40, Ryan, have we missed anything? Jim, have we missed anything? Does anybody have any more questions about the 308 Winchester? I mean, I can't think of anything. I feel like it doesn't, the, the fact of the matter is, if you have any, if you're a listener, if you have any additional questions on the 308, you can so easily find it. Yeah. What do yeah. we do? We're just adding yet another thing out there to the to the just absolute galaxy of, of, <laughs> of yeah, 308 <laughs> information. I mean, just a drop in the pail. <laughs> Just a drop in the will. 308 bucket of brass. That's right. That's right. Um, but I'd l- how about if there's people out there who are commenting on Instagram and all that stuff or on YouTube, I mean, talk about your 308s. Guarantee a good chunk of our listeners have some, or one at least. And uh, what kind of cool stuff have you done with it? Love the 308. Hate the 308. Thinking about getting a new gun, going to get a 308? Somebody probably well, does. Because of, because of that notion that it's not right. adequate. Hey, but do they? does that make them hate the 308 or just think, well, there's other things well, for me? Mark once told me, oh, 308, where do you put the ramrod? I know. I remember that. I was there. In fact, I've said that one before. Do you know, I think, I think you have taken more game with my 308 than I have. I think I've only shot the one. Yeah, thing Mark, what it. guns do you actually own besides your 300 Wizen that you don't apparently... Just never I use own that of. one, and then I use Ryan's. <laughs> I right. know. Why I know this. Ryan so much. I know this because it's such a sweet rifle. I know that more people 
than I have taken more game with that rifle than I have. Oh, guaranteed. Mark, you bought a 300 Wisdom because you told yourself, I'll be able to hunt anything in North America. Can you ever make anything too dead? And then you go out and you use Ryan's 308 all the time. Okay, I used that gun on that specific hunt because it was an extremely flyweight mountain rifle. What about your bear hunt? on... Which bear hunt? In Washington where you took my gun. No. Is that the one with the oh, dirt bikes? Oh, wait, yeah, I did take it on that hunt too. Yeah. And then... I did. I had a bear at 750, and I didn't shoot at it because I was worried. Oh, because it was a 308, not a 300 wisdom. Yeah. That's ludicrous. It was like having a, a governor on your throttle, Jim. Should have brought the wisdom. Would you have done that? Hmm. Would you? Have, would that's you, that's I what I want to know. I don't think I'd. Have, I don't that, think I'd have taken the shot. Yeah, actually. that's what I want to know. It's it's not it was, a matter it was of a really poke. Anything. The bear was on the move. We'd just gotten to the top. I was breathing heavy. Like, it just wasn't the optimal situation to take yeah, a long range that's, shot. The, the question was more so, would you have even done it with the 300 was in there? I, and I, I can't help but think. I mean, you do sometimes when you get in that mode. There's a certain mode I've seen you in, and you are you're you send. I mean, you know, I know. you know when you're confident making a shot or not confident making a shot. I've seen Mark. Have you seen Mark in that mode? Oh, yeah. Where he's, it doesn't matter what variables are at play. Metrics. What, <laughs> what surprises me it the always most, matters, Jim. What surprises me the <laughs> most is how responsible. good he is at it. Yes, I know. Thank and you it's for the bothersome to it me is. because it. I just yeah. We we it was before he went to Alaska with that that rifle. We were at the range. We did some validation to five hundred and forty seven yards, mm-hmm. and there was rested a steel chicken, um, standard chicken dimensions. So it's not a big plate, mm-hmm. but a steel chicken, no less. And Mark gets up, and he does that thing he does. You know, he gets up, and he's like, hi. He's like, I think. Kind of looks, assesses. Wait, but he sets it down no, and he then put, reassesses. He put one cartridge on the sled, and he closed it up, and he got in there, and he just settled in, forward to that safety, and offhanded that chicken at 547 oh. yards. And it peeled off, and I sat there, I was like. I could have done that 400 times. Wouldn't have been able to do it. He's, and he looks at it, he's like, that's a nice rifle. And he just set it down. And then we were good. I think... He's an exaggerator. That, really, that didn't happen? It might have happened. I don't know. It recall. happened. I think... Um, I'd love to see how many votes come in for Mark to get to 308. And then go a season just hunting with a 308. You could do it. Anybody could do it. When, you, you think, when I think about you almost nearly it. every shot that I've taken on game, not all, definitely not all, but most of them could have been... Handily taking care of with the 308. What do you mean, not all? Shot that moose at pretty long range. I've shot a coos deer. At, well, you probably could have done that one. A, a, a coos deer? Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the 308 could have handled that. It would have just been more drop. I'm not I'm not disrespecting the coos deer by any means because I love I'm just talking deer. about I the distance. I'm not talking oh, about distance. Okay. because it was, you know, fairly... You know, just a couple further shots out there. But not I just that find many, it funny you know, five, that in your in your things. in your repertoire of things in your head, you're like, man, the things that I don't think I could have used a 308 in a moose and a coos deer, <laughs> <laughs> the largest Opposite of wild deer, deer species in North America and the smallest of huntable <laughs> wild deer species. Yeah, okay, but everything in between. Yep, good. 308's go. great. Too big? Nope. Moose too big? Nope. Coos deer too small. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, you wouldn't want to take out you know too much meat, but. Uh, God, you love those things. We got to go back after him. I'm in. Well, okay. We've successfully Midwestern goodbye this one. Yep. So, well, slap your legs and stand up and be like, I got to get going. Nope. Yeah, I suppose. Yep. All right, everybody. Uh, tell your folks I say hey. All right. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening. Let us know in the comments your thoughts on the 308. We want to hear them. We gave you all of ours in about way overdue time. 11 minutes. We'll catch you on the next one. See ya. Loved it. That one just got really out of control. I loved every second of it. This box, I've seriously, got, it looks Ryan, like... I've got squatter's rights on those <laughs> last four cartridges in that box. You know what this box reminds me of? <laughs> this box reminds me of old beer cans where you would go... It's...
Oh, yeah. And you peel off the whole top. That's what this design reminds me of, doesn't it? The design reminds me of raiding my grandfather's ammunition locker. <laughs> you can still, uh, I still occasionally, not as much as I used to, but you can still occasionally find that style of uh, can out hunting in some of the most, like, oh, yeah. places random like, of places. With beer in it or, like, on the... No, no, just, no yeah, but no, you can I tell know, the I've style of When we were in Indiana turkey hunting with Trent, we found a couple. Oh, yeah, yeah, I forgot I, about I've that. I've often... I amuse myself with the thought that maybe like I was the first person that's been here in a long time. And then I always find like little things that are there. Right. And it's usually that kind of thing. Or for some reason, a Pepsi or Mountain Dew. Yeah, a lot of those. Now, like I want to put myself into the mind frame of the lady or gentleman who's like like getting your gear set, you know, and this is this is probably like 1974, 76, 78. Right. Like it's four and a half miles in. I better bring a Pepsi. <laughs> like, <laughs> Like the celebratory beer, I understand. Like people do that, you know, you, the guys who go climb 14,000 foot peaks in Colorado, they like have a picture of themselves up there with a beer because it's like a big crowning achievement. But would you ever have the wherewithal to think, I need to bring 12 fluid ounces of carbonated beverage in my pack? Well, so I'll deal with it always <laughs> being Pepsi or Mountain Dew, both Pepsi products. Nobody ever takes Coca Cola products. I've, the number of Coca Cola cans I've seen in the wild, you know what? Henceforth, I'm going to document every can of soda that I find in the woods, and then we're going to find out. Coke, again. Coke versus Pepsi. Yeah, we're going to call in it the woods. Pepsi, Pepsi Woods Litter Edition. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Oh man, this will be great on I'm your on Instagram. Hundred percent doing it. Um, so I hundred uh, percent doing it. It's I'm, always Pepsi and always Mountain Dew. I you mean, you're right. A, you ever seen a Dr. Pepper up there? Never. Occasionally. Oh, Rarely. wait, yeah, no. I Rarely. Say that, right? But I'd very, say that is, that's a rare, but also within the category of ones that you find. Mm -hmm. I think it's a sweetness thing. I think you somehow crave a little bit more sweet when, like, you're out there doing those sorts of things.